On one occasion, the Venerable Sariputta was dwelling at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Natapindika Spa. Now, on that occasion, the following pernicious view had arisen in a monk named Yamaka. As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, a monk whose asavas are destroyed is annihilated and perishes with the breakup of the body and does not exist after death. A number of monks heard that such a pernicious view had arisen in the monk Yamaka. Then they approached the Venerable Yamaka and exchanged greetings with him, after which they sat down to one side and said to him, Is it true, friend Yamaka, that such a pernicious view as this has arisen in you? As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, a monk whose asavas are destroyed is annihilated and perishes with the breakup of the body and does not exist after death. And he said, Exactly so, friends. As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, a monk whose asavas are destroyed is annihilated and perishes with the breakup of the body and does not exist after death. And they said, Friend Yamaka, do not speak thus. Do not misinterpret the Blessed One. It is not good to misrepresent the Blessed One. The Blessed One would not speak thus. A monk whose asavas are destroyed is annihilated and perishes with the breakup of the body and does not exist after death. We'll stop here for a moment. So here, uh, this monk, uh, uh, Yamaka, uh, he has this view uh, that uh, and, uh, Arahan, uh, uh, when he dies, uh, he is destroyed uh, and does not exist anymore. Uh. Actually, this is partly true, uh, uh, but uh, the way he has said it uh, is wrong uh, because he says uh, a monk is annihilated uh, when he dies, uh, uh, a monk who has finished his work. Uh, Sasavas are destroyed, nah, is annihilated, does not exist anymore after death. Nah. It is partly true in the sense that when uh, Arahan enters Nibbana, he does not exist anymore. Nah. But the Dhamma is teaching us nah, that even before he dies, nah, actually nah, he does not exist. Nah. The self does not exist. Nah. There is no such thing as the Arahan, nah, the person. Nah. He, uh, after you go, when we go to, uh, uh, through the sutta, you will understand. Uh, because uh, a person uh, is just a collection of five aggregates. Uh, and these collection of five, five aggregates are impermanent. So when the five aggregates come together, you say there is a person, there is a being. right? Uh, but it's just a temporary condition. In the first place, there's no, no such thing. Uh, just like a flower. When you plant a, a flowering plant, uh, initially there's no flower, and then you put water, you put fertilizer. After some time, the flower comes into existence. Right? Uh, then, after some time, the flower will wilt. Then you ask, where, where did the flower go? Uh, the flower is just a condition, uh, just a temporary condition. Uh, it does not, basically, there's no such thing as a flower. It's a temporary uh, manifestation. So a, a being is also a temporary manifestation. Uh, yet although he was admonished by the monks in this way, the Venerable Yamaka still obstinately grasped that pernicious view, adhered to it, and declared, As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, a monk whose asavas are destroyed is annihilated and perishes with the breakup of the body and does not exist after death. Since those monks were unable to detach the Venerable Yamaka from that pernicious view, they rose from their seats, approached the Venerable Sariputta, and told him all that had occurred, adding, It would be good if the Venerable Sariputta would approach the monk Yamaka out of compassion for him. The Venerable Sariputta consented by silence. Then in the evening, the Venerable Sariputta emerged from seclusion. He approached the Venerable Yamaka and exchanged greetings with him. After which he sat down to one side and said to him, Is it true, friend Yamaka, that such a pernicious view as this has arisen in you? As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, a monk whose asavas are destroyed is annihilated and perishes with the breakup of the body and does not exist after death. And he said, Exactly so, friend. And Venerable Saiputta asked him, What do you think, friend Yamaka? Is body permanent or impermanent? Impermanent friend uh, is what is impermanent suffering or happiness. Suffering is what is impermanent suffering subject to change, fit to be regarded as 
this is mine, this I am, this is myself. And he said, no, friend. And uh, so the Narasar Buddha said, uh, seeing thus uh, the noble Aryan disciple, uh, he becomes disenchanted uh, with body and uh, becomes dispassionate uh, and becomes liberated. Uh, similarly for feeling, perception, volition and consciousness. Uh. So here, Mabal Sariputta is making the point that the five agis are impermanent and a source of suffering, not fit to be regarded as I and mine. What do you think, friend Yamaka? You regard body as the Tathagata, the Buddha? No, friend. You regard feeling, perception, volition, consciousness as the Tathagata? No, friend. So here, uh, we're saying uh, that the body, the five aggregates uh, by themselves uh, is not the Buddha. What do you think, friend Yamaka? Do you regard the Tathagata as in or in the body? No, friend. Do you regard the Tathagata as apart from body? No, friend. Do you regard the Tathagata as in feeling? And he says, no, no, friend. As apart from feeling, etc. Volition, consciousness. So here, Venerable Sariputta is asking him, do you think the Buddha is inside the, the aggregates? And he says, no. Because the aggregates are impermanent. How can the Buddha be inside the aggregates? Then do you think the aggregates have nothing to do with the Buddha? Again, he says, no. You cannot say eh, the aggregates have nothing to do with the Buddha. What do you think, friend Yamaka? Do you regard body, feeling, perception, volition, consciousness taken, taken together as the Tathagata? And he says, no, friend. These five aggregates also, uh, uh, even you put them together, uh, it cannot be the Tathagata because they are all impermanent. What do you think, friend Yamaka? Do you regard the Tathagata as one who is without body, without feeling, without perception, without volition, without consciousness? No, friend. But friend, when the Tathagata is not apprehended by you as real and actual here in this very life, is it fitting for you to declare, as I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, a monk whose asavas are destroyed, is annihilated and perishes with the breakup of the body and does not exist after death. So here, remember, Saiputta uh, finally makes the point that uh, even in this very life, uh, the Buddha, you cannot say, is real and actual here. You can only describe him as the temporary aggregates, uh, but that aggregates also is not him. Uh, so how can he be annihilated uh, after he passes away? Uh? Then Venerable Yamaka said, Formerly, friend Sariputta, when I was ignorant, I did hold that pernicious view. But now that I have heard this Dhamma teaching of the Venerable Sariputta, I have abandoned that pernicious view and have made the breakthrough to the Dhamma. I mean, he has seen the Dhamma like, as a chain stream entry. Like. If friend Yamaka, they were to ask you, friend Yamaka, when a monk is an arahant, one whose asavas are destroyed, what happens to him with the breakup of the body after death? Being asked us, how, what would you answer? If they were to ask me this, friend, I would answer thus. Friends, body is impermanent. What is impermanent is suffering. What is suffering has ceased and passed away. Similarly, feeling, perception, volition and consciousness are impermanent. What are impermanent are suffering. What, what is suffering uh, have ceased and passed away. Being asked as friend, I would answer in such a way. Good, good, friend Yamaka. So, actually this monk Yamaka, uh, he has cultivated, uh, he's probably been the monk for many years. La. So when Venerable Sariputta explained this, uh, he very quickly uh, he grasped, the, the, understood the, the Dhamma. La. So he said he has seen the Dhamma. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, so Venerable Sariputta to confirm that he understood, uh, asked him uh, when an uh, arahant passes away, uh, what happens to him? Uh, then he says, uh, if people ask me this, uh, then I'll say uh, the five aggregates uh, are suffering uh, and the five aggregates, uh, when a person dies, uh, the five aggregates have ceased and passed away, uh, suffering has passed away. Uh. Good, good, friend Yamaka. Now, friend Yamaka, I will make up a simile for you in order to convey the same meaning even more clearly. Suppose, friend Yamaka, 
there was a householder or a householder's son, a rich man with much wealth and property protected by a bodyguard. Then some man would appear who wanted to ruin him, to harm him, to endanger him, to take his life. It will occur to that man, this householder or householder's son is a rich man with much wealth and property protected by a bodyguard. It will not be easy to take his life by force. Let me get close to him and then take his life. Then he would approach that householder or householder's son and say to him, I will serve you, sir. Then the householder or householder's son would appoint him as a servant. The man would serve him, rising up before him, retiring after him, doing whatever he wants, agreeable in his conduct, endearing in his speech. The householder or householder's son would consider him a friend, a bosom friend, and he would place trust in him. But when the man becomes aware that the householder or householder's son has placed trust in him, then finding him alone, he would take his life with a sharp knife. What do you think, friend Yamaka? When that man had approached that householder or householder's son and said to him, I would serve you, sir, wasn't he a murderer even then? though the other did not recognize him as my murderer. And when the man was serving him, rising up before him, retiring after him, doing whatever he wants, agreeable in his conduct, enduring in his speech, wasn't he a murderer then too, though the other did not recognize him as my murderer. And when the man came upon him while he was alone and took his life with a sharp knife, wasn't he a murderer then too? though the other did not recognize him as my murderer. Yes, friend. So too, friend Yamaka, the unlearned, ordinary worldling, who does not see noble ones and is unskilled and untrained in their Dhamma, who does not see superior persons and is unskilled and untrained in their Dhamma, regards body as self or self as possessing body or body as in self or self as in body. Similarly, he regards feeling, perception, volition, consciousness eh, as self or self as possessing the aggregates eh, or the aggregate as in the self or self as in the aggregates. Eh. He does not understand as it really is, impermanent body as impermanent, impermanent feeling as impermanent, impermanent perception, volition, consciousness as impermanent. He does not understand as it really is, painful body feeling, perception, volition, consciousness as painful. He does not understand as it really is selfless body, feeling, perception, volition and consciousness as selfless. He does not understand as it really is conditioned body, feeling, perception, volition, consciousness as condition. He does not understand as it really is murderous body, feeling, perception, volition, consciousness as murderous aggregates. He becomes engaged with body, clings to it, and takes a stand upon it as my self. Similarly, he becomes engaged with feeling, perception, volition, consciousness, clings to them, and takes a stand upon them as my self. These same five aggregates of clinging, to which he becomes engaged, and to which he clings to, lead to his harm and suffering for a long time. But friend, the learned noble disciple who is who sees noble ones uh, etc does not regard body as self or self as possessing body or body as in self or self as in body similarly he does not regard feeling perception volition consciousness uh, as self uh, or self as possessing the aggregates uh, or the aggregate as in the self or self as in the aggregates uh. he understands as is really as they really are, impermanent body, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness uh, as impermanent. He understands as they really are, painful uh, uh, body, feeling, perception, volition, consciousness uh, as painful aggregates. He understands as they really are, selfless body, feeling, perception, volition, consciousness uh, as selfless aggregates. He understands as they really are, conditioned body, feeling, perception, volition, consciousness uh, as conditioned aggregates. He understands as they really are, murderous body, feeling, perception, volition, consciousness, uh, as murderous aggregates. He does not become engaged with body, cling to it, and take a stand upon it as myself. 
he does not become engaged with feeling, perception, volition, consciousness, uh, cling to them uh, and take upon, take a stand upon them as myself. These same five aggregates of attachment to which he does not become engaged and to which he does not uh, attach uh, lead to his wealth and happiness for a long time. And then remember Yamaka said, so it is when Sariputta, for those venerable ones who have such compassionate and benevolent brothers in the holy life to admonish and instruct them. And now that I have heard this Dhamma teaching of the venerable Sariputta, my mind is liberated from the asavas by non-clinging. This is what the venerable Sariputta said. Elated, the venerable Yamaka delighted in the venerable Sariputta statement. That's the end of the sutta. So you see, eh? In our earliest discourses of the Buddha, always praise Venerable Sariputta as the disciple with the highest wisdom. So you see, uh, in several discourses, uh, he can teach the other monks uh, until they attain stream entry. Uh, or like in this case, uh, he taught this monk until this monk became an arahant. Uh, so the Buddha says uh, that the Venerable Sariputta turns the Dhamma wheel uh, exactly like the Buddha himself. Uh, that's why the Buddha praise Venerable Sariputta so much. But later, Mahayana books uh, always try to belittle this Venerable Sariputta. So, you see the last part, uh, this uh, uh, Venerable Sariputta made this simile uh, for this uh, Venerable Yamaka that uh, just like a murderer wants to murder somebody, uh, he comes disguised like, as a servant uh, and serves that man very well. Uh, but one day when the man is alone, uh, he kills him. Uh. So in the same way, uh, our five aggregates uh, serve us, uh, serve us very well. Uh, uh. We get pleasure from the five aggregates uh, and we are very pleased with the five aggregates. Uh. But the Buddha, uh, but the Venerable Sariputta says, uh, actually they are murderers. Uh, because when we cling to them, we attach to them uh, as I and mine. Uh. Then when the five aggregates cease, uh, when the body dies, uh, Ah, and then we feel uh, I die. That means I am murdered. Uh. Murdered by who? <laughs> by murdered uh, by these five aggregates. Uh, the same five aggregates uh, that we cling to, we thought was uh, our good friend, uh, the, our source of happiness. Uh. But it turns out uh, that because we cling to them, uh, so when they die, uh, we feel uh, I die. But for somebody like an Arahan, uh, although he has the same aggregates, uh, he does not cling to, to the aggregates, uh, he sees them as not self, uh, he sees them as impermanent, a source of suffering. Uh. So because he does not cling to them, uh, when the body dies, uh, he just knows uh, the body uh, being impermanent uh, uh, has uh, lived its shell life. Uh, uh, the time has come, uh, so it is dying. He does not attach to it, uh, so he does not suffer. You know. We suffer because we attach to the aggregates as I and mine. Uh, so uh, here the teaching uh, is to see them as murderers, uh, not something uh, to cling to, uh, to attach to. So that's uh, quite an interesting sutta, how he changed this monk uh, from a wrong view uh, to attain stream entry and further after teaching him that simile, uh, the monk attained liberation and became an arahan. The uh, next sutta is 22.87. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel sanctuary. Now, on that occasion, the Venerable Bakali was dwelling in a potter's shed, sick, afflicted, gravely ill. Then the Venerable Bakali addressed his attendants. Come, friends, approach the Blessed One. Pay homage to him in my name, with your head at his feet, and say, Venerable Sir, the monk Bakali is sick, afflicted, gravely ill. He pays homage to the Blessed One with his head at his feet. Then say, it would be good, Venerable Sir, if the Blessed One would approach the monk Vakali out of compassion. Yes, friend, those monks replied. And they approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, sat down to one side and delivered their message. The Blessed One consented by silence. Then the Blessed One dressed and taking bowl and robe, approached the Venerable Vakali. The Venerable Vakali saw the Blessed One coming in the distance and stirred on his bed. The Blessed One said to him, Enough, Vakali, do not stir on your bed. There are these seats ready. I will sit down there. Stop here for a moment. This Venerable Vakali was 
is one of the monks uh, who had great respect for the Buddha. You know. So when the Buddha came to see him, uh, even though he was uh, actually dying, uh, you know, so sick, uh, he was dying, uh, he tried to get up. Uh, but the Buddha told him, no need to get up. Uh, you have seats here. Uh, I will sit down. The Blessed One then sat down on the appointed seat and said to the Venerable Vakali, I hope you are bearing up, Vakali. I hope you are getting better. I hope that your painful feelings are subsiding and not increasing, and that their subsiding, not their increase, is to be discerned, to be seen. Venerable Sir, I am not bearing up. I am not getting better. Strong, painful feelings are increasing in me, not subsiding. And their increase, not their subsiding, is to be discerned. I hope then, Bakali, that you are not troubled by remorse and regret. Indeed, Venerable Sir, I have quite a lot of remorse and regret. I hope, Bakali, that you have nothing for which to reproach yourself in regard to virtue. And he said, I have nothing, Venerable Sir, for which to reproach myself in regard to virtue. Then, Bakali, if you have nothing for which to reproach yourself in regard to virtue, why are you troubled by remorse and regret? And he said, for a long time, Venerable Sir, I have wanted to come and see the Blessed One, but I haven't been fit enough to do so. And the Buddha said, Enough, Vakali. Why do you want to see this foul body? One who sees the Dhamma sees me. One who sees me sees the Dhamma. For in seeing the Dhamma, Vakali, one sees me. And in seeing me, one sees the Dhamma. I'll stop here for a moment. So he said, uh, he... He has remorse and regret. Nah. Why? Not because uh, he has broken the precepts, but because uh, he wanted to see the Buddha for a long time, uh, that he has been so sick, uh, he has not been able to walk to see the Buddha. Nah. And now that the Buddha has come near near to him, uh, he asks the other monks uh, to call the Buddha to come and see him. Nah. And the Buddha, the Buddha said, nah, Why do you want to see this smelly body? Nah? If you see the Dhamma, you have seen me. Nah. If you see... Me, you have seen the Dhamma. So now that we are studying the Dhamma, uh, we are seeing the Dhamma, so we are seeing the Buddha also. What do you think, Vakali? Is body permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, Venerable Sir. Uh, similarly, you know, is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? And it says suffering. Is what is impermanent subject to change, fit to re regarded as, fit to regarded as this, is mine, this I am, this is myself. And he says, no, Venerable Sir. So, similarly for feeling, perception, volition and consciousness. So, seeing thus, a noble disciple becomes disenchanted and then dispassionate and becomes liberated. Then the Blessed One, having given this exhortation to the Venerable Vakali, rose from his seat and departed from Mount Valchapi. Then not long after the Blessed One had left, the Venerable Vakali addressed his attendants thus, Come, friends, lift me up on this bed and carry me to the black rock on the Isigili slope. How can one like me think of dying among the houses? Yes, friend, those monks replied. And having lifted up the Venerable Vakali on the bed, they carried him to the black rock on the Isigili slope. Stop here for a moment. Huh? This Venerable Vakali, because he was sick, huh? They had put him in the porter's shed. No? He was dwelling in the porter's shed. No? But now that he knew uh, that he was going to die, uh, uh, during the Buddha's time, uh, almost all the monks uh, were forest monks. Uh. So he had been living in the forest a long time. Uh. Now that he was approaching death, uh, he thought uh, if he dies in the porter's shed, uh, it's like dying in a house. Uh, shameful. Uh, so he wanted uh, to die in the open air. Uh. Uh, so they asked, he asked them to carry him to the black rock uh, to die there. The Blessed One spent the rest of that day and night on Mount Valchapi. Then when the night was well advanced, two devatas of stunning beauty approached the Blessed One, illuminating the whole of Valchapi. Standing to one side, one devata said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, the monk Vakali is intent on deliverance. The other devata said, Surely, Venerable Sir, he will be liberated as one well liberated. This is what those devatas said. Having said this, they paid homage to the Blessed One. And keeping him on their right, they disappeared right there. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So 
So here you see, uh, in the middle of the night, uh, two devas came to inform the Buddha that the Venerable Vakali uh, was striving uh, with all his energy uh, to attain liberation, uh, to attain uh, enlightenment, uh, arahanhood. Uh. And then the other one said, uh, definitely he will attain uh, these, these devas because they are psychic. Uh, they are psychic. Uh, they know what they are saying. Uh. So, uh, this also shows uh, sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes the Buddha doesn't know something, uh, they will come and inform the Buddha. Uh. Sometimes because the Buddha doesn't know, because the Buddha doesn't contemplate, uh, sometimes he's deep in samadhi. Uh. Then when the night had passed, the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Come, monks, approach the monk Vakali and say to him, Friend Vakali, listen to the words of the Blessed One and two devatas. Last night, friend, when the night was well advanced, two devatas of stunning beauty approached the Blessed One. One devata said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, the monk Vakali is intent on deliverance. The other devata said, Surely, Venerable Sir, he will be liberated, as one well liberated. And the Blessed One says to you, friend Vakali, Do not be afraid, Vakali, do not be afraid. Your death will not be a bad one. Your demise will not be a bad one. Let's stop here for a moment. Uh, so here the Buddha is uh, asking the monks uh, to inform the Venerable Vakali uh, that uh, the Deva said uh, that he will attain liberation, uh, which is also an encouragement for him uh, to press on uh, and attain liberation. And also, the, probably the Buddha foresaw uh, that he was going to commit suicide. So the Buddha told him, uh, don't be afraid, uh, your death will not be evil. Uh, this, uh, when you die, uh, you won't, uh, there will there be nothing wrong with it. Uh. I think uh, that's a hint to him uh, that what, whatever he does, uh, uh, don't worry, uh, it's not, uh, not evil. Yes, Venerable Sir, those monks replied. And they approached the Venerable Vakali and said to him, Friend Vakali, listen to the word of the Blessed One and two devas. Then the Venerable Vakali addressed his attendants, Come, friends, lower me from the bed. How can one like me think of listening to the Blessed One's teaching while seated on a high seat? Yes, friend, those monks replied. And they lowered the Venerable Vakali from the bed. Stop here for a moment. You see, this Venerable Vakali uh, has so much respect for the Buddha that when they wanted to pass a message to him from the Buddha, immediately uh, he said uh, to put him on the ground. He doesn't want to listen to the Buddha uh, sitting on the bed. And they told him, Last night, friend, two devatas of stunning beauty approached the Blessed One. One devata said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, the monk Vakali is intent on deliverance. The other Devata said, Surely, Venerable Sir, he will be liberated as one well liberated. And the Blessed One says to you, friend Vakali, Do not be afraid, Vakali, do not be afraid. Your death will not be a bad one. Your demise will not be a bad one. And he said, Well then, friends, pay homage to the Blessed One in my name with your feet at his head and say, Venerable Sir, the Mount Vakali is sick, afflicted, gravely ill. He pays homage to the Blessed One with his head at his feet. Then say, Body is impermanent. I have no doubt about this, Venerable Sir. I do not doubt that whatever is impermanent is suffering. I do not doubt that in regard to what is impermanent, suffering and subject to change. I have no more desire, lust or affection. Similarly, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness uh, are impermanent. I have no perplexity about this. I do not doubt that whatever is impermanent is suffering. I do not doubt that in regard to what is impermanent, suffering and subject to change, I have no more desire, lust, or affection. Yes, friend, those monks replied. And then they departed. Stop here for a moment. So here uh, is asking them to inform the Buddha that he has no more doubt uh, that he has cut off desire and lust uh, for the five aggregates. Uh, in other words, uh, probably uh, he has already attained Arahanthood. Uh, he's trying to tell them to tell the Buddha that he has uh, 
no doubt lah about his attainment. Uh, so the monks uh, departed. Uh. That not long after those monks had left, the venerable Vakali used the knife. That means he committed suicide with the knife. Uh. Then those monks approached the Blessed One and delivered their message. The Blessed One then addressed the monks thus, Come monks, let us go to the black rock on the Isigili slope where the clansman Vakali has used the knife. Yes, my sir, those monks replied. Then the Blessed One, together with a number of monks, went to the black rock on the Isigili slope. The Blessed One saw in the distance the Venerable Vakali lying on the bed with his shoulder turned. Now on that occasion, a cloud of smoke, a swirl of darkness, was moving to the east, then to the west, to the north, to the south, upwards, downwards, and to the intermediate quarters. The Blessed One then addressed the monks thus, do you see, monks, that cloud of smoke, that swirl of darkness, moving to the east, then to the west, then to the north, to the south, upwards, downwards, and to the intermediate quarters? Yes, Venerable Sir. That monks is Mara, the evil one, searching for the consciousness of the clansman Vakali, wondering, where now has the consciousness of the clansman Vakali been established? However, monks, with consciousness unestablished, the clansman Vakali has attained final Nibbana. That's the end of the Sutta. So here, uh, at the end, uh, you see, Mara is looking to, to, to find out where did Vakali take rebirth, lah? where did his consciousness go to. Lah? But the Buddha says, uh, his consciousness uh, is no more. Lah. Uh, he will not uh, take rebirth. Lah. He has attained Nibbana. Uh, so this uh, confirms uh, that all the Arahans uh, have finished their work, uh, not like the Mahayana books say, uh, they have not finished their work. Uh, just like the Buddha, when they enter Nibbana, uh, their consciousness, or the six consciousness ceases. Uh. So you see this uh, monk, uh, he was in great pain, uh, his body, uh, he was dying, and he knew he was dying, uh, that's why he put all his effort uh, to attain liberation. Uh. So that's why the deva, devas, uh, Realize uh, that he was putting so much effort, uh, he surely will attain liberation. So the Buddha also foresaw uh, that he would attain liberation. So the Buddha told him, uh, whatever you do, uh, don't be afraid. Uh. So maybe with that uh, comforting words of the Buddha, he uh, committed suicide. Uh. Because for an arahan uh, to commit suicide, uh, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh. It does not kill a cell because there's no more cell to kill. Uh. And although uh, Arahan is liberated, uh, uh, the Buddha says uh, uh, he still has body suffering. Uh, he, uh, all Aryans, uh, all uh, noble ones uh, have eliminated uh, mental suffering, but they still have body suffering. So because of his great body suffering, uh, do you, you know, at, at that time uh, they did not have painkillers like we have now. <laughs> so he's used the knife as a painkiller. <laughs> Uh, we stop here. I think to discuss and to a few important suttas here. Yes, the Buddha said uh, for a lay person, uh, you practice the eight precepts once a week. During the Buddha's time, they practice on like, the eighth day of the lunar calendar, the 15th, 23rd, and the 30th day. Uh, so either you can follow that or you choose one day of the week uh, that is convenient, for example, uh, Sunday or Saturday or whatever. And Makkah is the one with the wrong view. Huh? I think it's stated in the Sutta huh, that uh, after Venerable Sariputta explained, huh, he said he made the breakthrough to the Dhamma, yeah? uh, attain Arahanthood. Oh. From the Sutta itself, huh, it appears like the same day. Huh?
um, method is the same la, in the uh, what is stated in the suttas. Eh? We keep our sila to practice uh, meditation eh? to strengthen the mind eh? and study the suttas eh? to get wisdom. Eh? And then um, also other conditions. Eh? You see, for example, if a person can practice aloofness, eh? not associating with others, eh? so that he can put more effort. Eh? And other things like uh, there's a list on the charana, uh, conduct or practice for a monk, uh, contentment, practicing contentment, and uh, moderation in eating, uh, jagarya and yoga. Uh, how do you say? Trying to keep awake, uh, not to sleep so much, uh, and uh, guarding the sense doors. Uh, don't expose yourself uh, to the sense doors. Uh, see the sense doors are quite important because uh, the uh, guardians uh, whether we allow certain things to come into our senses or not uh, because if the wrong things come into our senses uh, then it stirs stirs up our passions and all that uh, uh, so it's helpful uh, to restrict yourself uh, you know certain things uh, for example the internet is not good uh, then you don't uh, try to cut off the internet uh, watching TV uh, and all that. Uh, I try to folly people, uh, not to uh, indulge in them. Uh. Now for a monk, uh, because a monk, if you stay in a forest monastery, uh, all these uh, actually are uh, already cut off. Uh. So you can have a look at the uh, Tarana, the conduct. Right. But you see, like that day we read the suttas on the monk, what's his name? The one who uh, uttered, inspired uh, verses. Uh, uh, Vangisa, the venerable Vangisa, being a young monk, uh, he was always disturbed by sensual thoughts. But because of his understanding of the Dhamma, his determination was very strong uh, to... Uh, like in the, the first sutta we you read, uh, all the monks had left the monastery. He was alone guarding the monastery, and then these beautiful girls came in, uh, uh, well dressed and all that. Uh, and then all his previous habits uh, all came up now. The thoughts. Uh, so he then he decided, uh, who can help him? Nobody can help him because his thoughts are inside. Uh, uh, so he decided uh, to fight, uh, fight his own thoughts uh, inside. Uh, so. That's why last night I mentioned uh, the mind is a forerunner of all states. If you think you are weak, uh, then you will be weak. If you think you are strong and you make a determination to be strong, then you are strong. Uh, so whether you allow yourself to be weak or to be strong uh, also depends on your understanding. Uh. If, you're, if you have a good understanding of the Dhamma, then... Uh, you will realize uh, that even though it's difficult also, uh, die also I'll do it. Uh. Just like the Buddha says, uh, uh, having known the Dhamma, uh, you should make that determination. Uh, let my body waste away. Uh. Uh, let only the bones and the, and the skin remain. Uh. But I will not slack uh, in my energetic striving uh, until I attain what can be attained by manly effort, uh, manly striving. So understanding the Dhamma is very important. If you understand, then we know difficult also, we have to do it. Then our mind we have to make the resolve. If you don't have the resolve, you can never do anything. If you start off, you already think, I can't, I can't, I can't. I can't. Then definitely you can't. <laughs> Restlessness is uh, something quite difficult uh, because uh, if you look at the five uh, higher factors, uh, actually the restlessness is eliminated uh, only by the arahan. So the uh, only thing is uh, as we go older, uh, we don't become so restless. It's like temper also. When we are young, uh, our temper is very great. As we go older, uh, slowly, slowly, uh, 
uh, fire cool down. Uh, so also whether it's physical age or spiritual age, uh, if you are spiritually mature, uh, you listen a lot to the Buddha's words, uh, then you become uh, old spiritually. Uh, then it's faster to to let go of uh, all these things. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. yes. So you have to observe your your own self. Uh, each person is different. There is something in the sutta uh, about uh, balancing. Uh, when you put too much effort, uh, uh, then uh, restlessness arises. Uh, then uh, in that case, uh, you must concentrate harder uh, to attain tranquility, uh, to attain samadhi. And if you find that sitting uh, is difficult, uh, when you are restless, uh, then you do walking. Walking. This one you have to what not see the consequences of your action, na? see whether it's at the expense of your practice or not. Uh, if it affects your practice, uh, then you have to consider uh, again uh, not to spend so much time in the kitchen. A lot of things uh, sometimes we have to reflect, uh, reflect and uh, consider. Like the Buddha says, uh, uh, whatever we do uh, before doing it, now uh, we must reflect the consequences and then while we are doing also uh, we must reflect whether it's beneficial or it's harmful and after we have done it also uh, we must reflect uh, so we constantly reflect on our actions uh, then uh, our actions become more and more pure purified and more skillful maybe we, 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 uh,